I'm Harriet Vanceball, Associate Professor of Medicine, Cardiologist at McMaster University in Canada, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me Dr. Eugene Braunwald, Distinguished Hersey Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and founding chairman of the Timmy Study Group. We are here to discuss his life, achievements, and research advice for young trainees. Welcome, Dr. Braunwald. Thank you. Nice to be here. I'm so delighted to talk to you uh, in this master class. And I wonder if you could begin by telling us about your early life, how you came to the United States from Austria and chose to begin studying medicine here. Okay. So until the age of nine, um, I was born in Vienna and until the age of nine, I led a wonderful life in Vienna. Um, uh, my parents were interested in opera and they took me to the opera as a, as a kid. I went to a wonderful school. I had um, a special tutor in English. And then um, the Nazis came in, in, uh, uh, in March, 1938, and uh, we escaped. Um, uh, we escaped as uh, really as refugees and ended up um, in uh, England. Uh, and then came to the United States um, after World War II began in 1939 with a very close call. And um, um, fortunately, uh, our nuclear family made it. Uh, we lived in Brooklyn. Um, I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, which is a terrific school, an elite school that at that time required uh, uh, a uh, tough entrance exam. I went from there to NYU, and then I went to NYU College of Medicine. Uh, and um, in medical school, um, they began, it was one of the first schools in the country to begin an elective program. Um, uh, before that, medical education was uh, uh, straight through without any uh, choices. And I elected to work in a cardiac catheterization laboratory. Now, cardiac catheterization, we're back now in 1951. Cardiac catheterization was a, a tough research procedure. It was not a diagnostic test. And um, the first project that I worked on was uh, congestive heart failure and the hemodynamics in heart failure. Um, and um, then I went on to uh, uh, my um, uh, clinical training at Mount Sinai and I had uh, three cardiology fellowships. Um, uh, one at Mount Sinai in cardiac catheterization, the second one back at Bellevue Hospital um, with Andre Cournand, who was the father of cardiac catheterization. And I was there the year before he won the Nobel Prize. It was a terrific laboratory. And from there, I went to the NIH um, where I worked in cardiovascular physiology, more basic. Uh, so I took three fellowships um, and then um, um, became head of the cath lab there. Um, and um, uh, so uh, cardiology has been part of my life, uh, um, you know, like for 70 years. Right, so some pivotal training experiences in exceptional centers, and I imagine mentorship played a key role in your career trajectory. Tell us about how the adversities in your childhood, however, um, shaped you as a person and as a researcher, focusing on your years as a refugee and escaping yeah. what would have been a time of uh, great pain and uncertainty and also injustice. How have they shaped you? Well, I think that um, um, what I learned from uh, uh, that um, uh, experience uh, were the two, the, that there were two things that were terribly important. The first one, the most important one was family. Um, there were many times during um, uh, this period when uh, something came up 
where the four of us, I have a younger brother, um, uh, were the, the question of separation came up. And my father insisted that we all stay together. Uh, we can't have one go down and three live. If we're going to die, we're going to die together. If we're going to live, we're going to live together. And that imbued a feeling of family, which uh, I have tried to transmit to my children and uh, grandchildren. So family is the most important thing. And the cohesion of family is something that I learned during those three years that were difficult. I think the other thing that I learned um, uh, and which has stood me well is um, uh, it's normal to work very hard. Um, uh, we were very poor and my parents had to begin to work um, immediately uh, just to put bread on the table. And um, um, it, um, uh, you know, they, they worked um, 12, 15 hour days both in uh, England and in New York, uh, just to stay afloat. Uh, and there were times that we uh, had to have charity. It was that bad. But they worked hard and they um, uh, pulled us out, both of my parents. So I began to feel that hard work 12 to 15 hours a day is the normal. Uh, and uh, a strange thing happens. I enjoyed it. I began to enjoy, and what was I involved in? I was involved in studying. I was involved. So, um, um, so where people, uh, uh, colleagues and friends, um, uh, you know, were looked, looking for relaxation, for me, relaxation was continuing to work in the evenings and on weekends. So, um, and uh, I got positive reinforcement from that. And I think that that is something that has stood with me. And here now I'm in my nineties and I'm working maybe not 15 hour days, but I'm certainly working 12 hour days, six and a half days a week and enjoying it. I think the other thing that, that uh, was sort of unexpected was not only the enjoyment, but uh, the fact that uh, uh, I've become, I became immediately very curious. I wanted to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Some powerful lessons there and yeah. the importance of family, unity, work ethic, and yeah. finding joy in work yeah. uh, because that's what it takes um, to succeed. Yeah. Um, what do you consider your greatest achievements? You certainly stand out as a giant in cardiology and you're probably one of the easiest um, to recognize on public platforms and in conversation, your name comes up so often. I wonder what you think your greatest achievements are. Well, I would say um, what I am most uh, excited about, um, most proud of, was the concept of um, infarct size reduction. So the idea um, uh, all the way into the late 1960s was that uh, Coronary thrombosis happens very suddenly. Uh, the tissue dies very suddenly. And um, then you have to do the best you can to stop arrhythmias, prevent arrhythmias, and uh, maybe teach, uh, uh, do something about cardiogenic shock. Um, from clinical observation, it's very important. It really began with a single patient um, uh, who had a stuttering infarct and then seeing other patients with stuttering infarct who, um, who's with SDA elevation, whose ST segments would 
come up and go down, and go up and down. And I saw that in several patients. And that gave me the idea that it, it's not like throwing a light switch where you turn the lights off, which is the way people thought about it and the way I thought about it uh, all the way through the 60s. So we began experiments um, in, um, um, in uh, open chest dogs and uh, worked on it for a couple of years and were able to show that uh, it is possible to influence the size of an infarction, infarction produced by clamping uh, the uh, coronary artery, uh, large uh, vessel. And, um, uh, and we found that um, reducing oxygen demands by the heart with uh, beta blockers or slowing the heart rate um, uh, uh, reduced infarct size and most important perfusion. Um, and uh, in the dog after three hours, you could still get substantial um, uh, salvage of myocardium. And then taking this into patients. And uh, f first, all we had was the concept that we published the concept very clearly in circulation. At, and said that if you could, find, if there was a way of reperfusion rapidly, and that was in 1971, but there was no way of doing that. And uh, in uh, 1975, Eugene Chazov, a famous Soviet uh, uh, cardiologist, uh, injected uh, um, streptokinase directly into an occluded coronary artery and whoa, it opened up and uh, perfused uh, uh, the uh, uh, ischemic myocardium. And uh, then we showed that it was possible that, that, that you could actually salvage tissue, mm -hmm. that the ischemic tissue isn't dead because uh, when it's reperfused, some of it, not all of it, but some of it, um, regains normal function. And um, that um, um, has been a, a useful concept. Uh, obviously, we now do it very differently with stenting and, uh, and other techniques, but um, uh, I'm uh, happy and proud of the idea. Right, one of very, very many things to be happy and proud of, but certainly this was key in our understanding of myocardial infarction and in the care we now provide patients to improve outcomes. Yeah. Um, if you had a chance to do your career again, yeah. would you do anything differently? And if so, what would you do differently? Yeah, I certainly would. Um, um, I, I spent um, 35 years in um, major administrative jobs. Uh, I was um, a, um, a Department of Medicine chairman, um, both at the University of California and at Harvard. And I have chaired three departments of medicine uh, over 28 years. And then for seven years, I was chief academic officer in our health system, 35 years. And in looking back, uh, yes, I got a lot from that, but uh, I shouldn't have stayed that long because there were certain things that I couldn't do because of the time that it took. Um, uh, in, if you're going to do your job administratively, it's a huge, these were huge jobs. It isn't like running a cardiology division. I don't consider that uh, administrative um, or uh, uh, setting up uh, 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 Timmy. Um, uh, I mean, that's part of research. But you know, dealing with faculty, dealing with their salaries, uh, fighting the hospital administration, arguing with the deans, and so forth takes a lot of time. Uh, I did protect time, or you know, through all those thirty-five years, I, I I didn't have a year 
that I didn't uh, uh, have at least 25% of my time um, for research, but I could have had 100% and that mm -hmm. would have been better. So looking back, uh, 35 years was too much, maybe 10 would have been sufficient. Right, people talk about um, harmony within various aspects of our career and our personal life, but really anything we invest time in competes with some other aspect that we yeah. could potentially divert our attention to and, our, and invest our energies in. Um, what advice would you give to young researchers starting out a research career in cardiology? Well, I think that um, um, I, I would go back to fellowship. If mm -hmm. you are looking for a career in cardiology, um, uh, I'm thinking about an academic career. I mean, there are. I mean, I think I hold clinicians in the highest regard um, uh, because. The whole enterprise is to have good physicians and training them. Mm -hmm. uh, being an academician uh, it, it means that you have certain responsibilities for training others and for moving the field forward. And I would say that of all the decisions that uh, you make uh, about um, your education and about your career, the one that stands out the most, that's the most important one, is where you do your research fellowship and who you choose as your mentor. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about what college to go to. It's important. After college, you have a choice of medical schools. Uh, What's the best medical school to go to? After that comes residency. Again, you know, what's the best place to go and get your residency training? And then you have where you're going to do your cardiology fellowship and so forth. None of these matter as much as who is your mentor in research, whether it's at the bench whether it's at the bedside or whether it's for a population, it doesn't matter. And I think that, um, uh, that uh, uh, people don't pay enough attention to that. They pay attention to all of these steps getting there. Mm -hmm. But getting there, is, and, the, and you got to do your homework about the mentor. You have to ask people who have worked in that institution or have worked in that laboratory or that institute? How did they do with Dr. So-and-so? And, -so? and uh, uh, sometimes a big name is not the right name um, mm -hmm. because they may be too busy flying from here to there uh, and not available. Or they may be, or maybe they ho hold a job uh, uh, of being chairman of a huge department and don't have the time for their two research fellows. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of things that go into that. So you have to get, you, you really have to look very carefully uh, at, at, and what you want is a mentorship that guides you and lets you grow. So that uh, in a, over a period of, let's say three years of, of research training that you are, uh, have a lot of supervision at the beginning, just like the same way as an intern does when they graduate medical school. But that at the end of the three years, you're like a senior resident, you're, uh, and, and uh, that you are allowed to grow and become independent. So those are the characteristics. And you have to do your homework to find out whether the place and the person that you're thinking about will uh, help you attain that. Right, so a balance of somebody who provides guidance and opportunity, but gives you the breathing room to grow with time. What right. are the biggest research gaps in cardiology that you think we ought to close 
to improve care and outcomes in those living with cardiovascular disease across the globe. Where do you see uh, research headed in the next okay. five to 10 well, years? Well, I think the most important thing is that we um, um, get rid of cardiologists. What do I mean by that? <laughs> I think that, that the next challenge is prevention. Mm -hmm. Prevention, prevention, prevention. I agree. Yeah. And I am particularly interested in primordial prevention. And I think primordial prevention can begin in uh, neonatal life. In other words, I think, I think pediatricians uh, uh, may, should be taking over the field because I think that, that uh, the terrible ravages of hypertension, uh, the strokes from hypertension, uh, the uh, atherosclerosis is still the com most common uh, uh, cause of death uh, in the world. And I think that uh, risk factors can be uh, identified very, very early. Uh, now with GWAS, it's possible to uh, do that to a newborn. That hasn't been done yet on a routine basis, but I think that could be done the same way as we do certain tests for newborns. You can also do a GWAS, it's inexpensive now. And then you can see uh, using polygenic analyses. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a, a newborn that in 30 years has a risk of having hypertension. And therefore we ought to do something about it, maybe dietary sodium intake from the beginning. And I think that uh, that's the direction that we should be heading. I don't think we're gonna get there in one step, but I think we have to uh, divert attention, divert uh, resources to look more at prevention at every level, ultimately primordial. But um, uh, we have to look at prevention in the developing areas. Right, and also integration with higher level interventions, I think through policy and public health initiatives so that yes. we could move population health towards uh, prevention, right? And, absolutely, and absolutely. Yeah. But, but ultimately, we're gonna get to the point where where the population is not going to, is going to be healthy, and uh, right. and and, and uh, but that's the ultimate goal, and I don't think we're going to reach it in the next ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just thank you so much for your time. It was such an honor for me to sit down with you to learn from you, and what a source of inspiration to all of us that you have overcome. Um, life-threatening adversity and shaped our um, careers, shaped research, shaped the care we provide patients and remained gracious through it all. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunwald, for continuing to inspire us. Thank you.